of the advisory committees uh, um, to the Congressional Internet Caucus's uh, seminars on VOIP. Uh, uh, the uh, program is brought to you by the Internet Caucus, Congressional Internet Caucus and by its advisory committee. The uh, uh, chairs of the uh, Internet Caucus are Senator Burns and Senator Leahy, uh, Congressman Goodlatte and Congressman Boucher. Uh, we're delighted to have the turnout we've got, uh, and we're going to jump right into the program. Uh, um, we've got uh, several uh, experts uh, who uh, are going to be engaged in a dialogue uh, with us, uh, and uh, uh, let me just introduce them from left to right. Uh, uh, Praveen Goyal is the Senior Counsel for Government and Regulatory Affairs at COVAD Communications. Uh, uh, prior to joining COVAD, he was an attorney in the Wireline Competition Bureau at the FCC. Jim Dempsey is the Executive Director of the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, uh, prior to doing that, he had several jobs in the private sector and before that uh, actually worked a little on Kalia uh, when he was uh, a staff member of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, uh, Next to him uh, uh, is Tony Rutkowski, who's the Vice President uh, for Regulatory Affairs of VeriSign. Uh, uh, his uh, career is uh, long and distinguished, and so long and distinguished that I can't get it all into this, uh, these brief remarks, uh, but he's written uh, several books and several hundred articles. Uh, he's worked at SAIC, General Magic, and Sprint, uh, uh, and at one point worked on, I think, Computer One at the FCC. Uh, Computer two, sorry. Uh, and uh, finally, Mike Warren uh, is an old friend uh, of mine. He's the president of FiduciaNet, uh, uh, which, uh, like VeriSign, offers uh, services uh, in the uh, area of uh, uh, wiretapping and law enforcement discovery. Uh, um, uh, originally in his career, he was a uh, special agent at the FBI, and he spent the last four years of his career uh, running the Kalia section uh, for the FBI. Uh, uh, he then joined Steptoe and Johnson, which is uh, my firm, uh, uh, for a time and then went out on his own to, to form FiduciaNet. Uh, and I'm Stuart Baker. I'm a lawyer at Steptoe and Johnson. Uh, uh, my original connection with uh, uh, Kalia came because I was the general counsel of the National Security Agency when the FBI was first encountering its major problems with uh, uh, new forms of wiretapping. Uh, we had a lot of consultations in, during the run-up to uh, uh, Kalia. I left uh, shortly before it passed and uh, announced that I was going to go into private practice as the first lawyer who understood that the principal telecom regulatory body in the United States was the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It has turned out to be uh, a useful insight and has uh, uh, generated a, a lot of uh, uh, very interesting work over the last 10 years. Um, the, the way we're going to run this program uh, is I thought I'd give you an overview that would get you into the Kalia issues, try to bring you up to date. Uh, uh, and then we're going to, uh, I'll sit down and we'll have a dialogue among the uh, 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 members of the panel. If you've got a question that arises from something somebody says, just raise your hand. Mm -hmm. uh, this is meant to be a pretty informal dialogue and we will uh, 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 add your contribution uh, to the discussion. Um, I promised I would give a short background on this, uh, but uh, to understand what's going on in Kalia, you really un have to go back to the breakup of AT&T in the mid-80s. Uh, before that, law enforcement had no wiretap problems to speak of. Uh, uh, they dealt with one company. Uh, this is a company that could uh, do uh, whatever government wanted and add the costs to the rate base uh, uh, and charge uh, uh, customers for the added cost of meeting uh, whatever social obligations the company was prepared to undertake. Uh, uh, there was no question about where you would go to, to take account of uh, uh, wiretaps. You always went to Ma Bell and they always uh, did what you needed and when they were designing their switches, they uh, uh, designed switches that would do uh, the wiretapping that they understood was required. Uh, but when Ma Bell broke up, things started to get bad for uh, uh, law enforcement, but very gradually and uh, uh, sort of in stages. Uh, the first thing that happened, of course, was that you had uh, competition in uh, long distance. 
by and large, that didn't create a problem for uh, uh, law enforcement because they said, well, that's all right. We won't wiretap long distance. We'll just wiretap people's home phones. You, you know, there's, nobody's making long distance calls uh, from one long distance station to another. They, they end up at somebody's uh, uh, telephone, some local service. We'll conduct all of our wiretaps on local service. So the first tranche of um, uh, competition didn't matter uh, to law enforcement. But the second one did, uh, and that was the emergence of wireless uh, mobile phone networks. And uh, uh, once the uh, breakup had occurred, the uh, competition to provide digital switches to uh, 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 local phone companies, uh, replacing some of the analog switching that had occurred before that. Uh, because those things started happening in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, uh, and particularly in the wireless area, uh, law enforcement found itself dealing with companies that weren't able to pass their uh, costs on to the rate base. They had to make a profit, uh, and they were in bitter competition each with each other. Uh, the result of that was that the first wireless systems were designed without really much thought given to how wiretaps would ca be carried out. Uh, uh, and in a sort of embarrassing uh, uh, bailing wire and uh, chewing gum solution, uh, wiretaps were carried out by opening up repair ports in the equipment, uh, uh, which would allow access to the communications. But since there were only about 10 uh, for a metropolitan area, you had the remarkable situation of uh, law enforcement agency after law enforcement agency having to get in a queue uh, in New York City uh, and decide whether they wanted to follow uh, Soviet spies or mafia murderers, uh, and they couldn't do both. Uh, that was uh, a, a uh, searing experience for law enforcement, and they began uh, uh, urging that Congress take an approach that would uh, guarantee that wiretapping of mobile phones and digital uh, switches would, con would be possible. Uh, that was the early 1990s. Uh, um, the first proposals from the FBI were, were quite aggressive. The, they basically did want the FBI to do all the telecom regulatory uh, uh, re uh, approvals uh, for new equipment in the United States. Uh, uh, after extensive negotiations and a lot of uh, changes to the uh, uh, law, CALEA passed uh, in October, October 4th, 1994, the probably the last thing that a Democratic majority in the House was able to do, and everybody left on uh, uh, the election recess immediately thereafter. Um, CALEA uh, did, imposed several requirements, essentially people who uh, uh, ran wireless and uh, at, at a minimum local phone service were required to carry out uh, wiretaps to build systems that would carry out wiretaps that would provide both access to the communications and um, uh, access to the available information about the call, what number was being called, what number was calling in, and a variety of call identifying information. So that, that was the essential uh, requirement of the law. We'll, we'll talk more about exactly what it requires uh, um, shortly. Uh, and after CALEA was passed, industry began the process of coming into compliance. Um, there was a long 10-year period, uh, actually probably two five-year periods. The first five years were devoted to the wireless in, and wireline industry drafting standards designed to say, this is how we're going to meet our CALEA obligations, because industry standards were given special recognition by CALEA, uh, and so industry took the lead in drafting those standards. The law allows the FBI to challenge those standards if they think they're inadequate. And uh, in the late 1990s, that's exactly what the FBI did. There was a fight that went to the FCC, that went to the DC Circuit, with that, that went back to the FCC. Uh, not interestingly about uh, whether uh, law enforcement would get access to the communications when it had a Title III order. Uh, uh, by and large, that was the easy part of the negotiations over uh, CALEA. The hard part turned out to be what kinds of information about the call is going to be provided to law enforcement. Uh, uh, and we'll uh, talk again about that question because I think that's a remains and will continue to be for the foreseeable future one of the toughest policy issues and the most divisive between 
law enforcement and uh, and industry. Uh, um, in the end, uh, uh, the difference was more or less split. Several of the original uh, uh, features that the FBI had wanted were rejected either by the Justice Department or the FCC or the courts, uh, but all, uh, at least half of them were uh, adopted as required by, uh, uh, by Kalia uh, in an FCC decision that ultimately was not um, appealed. That was about half of the, the last 10 years. Uh, uh, the other half, uh, I think, is what has brought us here, is the emergence of yet a third wave of new technology uh, and new competition in telecom, which is VOIP and, and Internet communications. Uh, uh, after the uh, standards fight was more or less over, uh, the FBI uh, uh, faced the question of how it was going to get some new technologies covered uh, uh, in a way that was satisfactory to the Bureau. And, and they went down what I think are, have turned out to be a couple of blind alleys. Uh, uh, one, they began a flexible deployment program which was designed to say to industry, if you want an extension of time for, for the deadlines uh, uh, that are coming up for compliance with CALEA, you have to come in and show us all the things that you're doing and show us how you're going to come into compliance. And if we don't like your plan, then we will oppose your request for an extension extension of time. Uh, and that was an effort to use the leverage of, of extensions of time to, to get design changes. It worked to some degree, but it was not, it really did not give the Bureau everything that it wanted as it, as it discovered as time went on. And the other thing that the Bureau did was uh, uh, it uh, drafted its own standards, essentially, its own documents that uh, would be used by standards groups, it hoped, to uh, uh, provide precisely the kinds of wiretap uh, capabilities that the Bureau uh, wanted to receive. Uh, and again, this, was, this turned out to be a partially successful uh, mechanism. Uh, uh, that's because not every industry was prepared to accept the standards as drafted by the FBI. Uh, and so as they began making changes, the Bureau began to realize that it was not going to get exactly the design features that it wanted out of this process. And that brings us to the current situation. Uh, that is to say, uh, uh, having decided it was not really going to get uh, all of what it wanted, the Bureau has filed a petition with the FCC that asks for a number of uh, uh, changes in interpretation of the, the of CALEA and a set of rules that will uh, govern CALEA uh, implementations uh, uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, in very brief outline, what the uh, FBI has asked for is a ruling that Internet access is covered uh, by CALEA, uh, that VOIP is covered by CALEA, uh, and that uh, they've asked the FCC to adopt a, a, a very stringent set of rules that impose heavy penalties on industry if they can't come up with a satisfactory implementation for CALEA uh, within about uh, a year. Um, and this would involve uh, a lot of regulatory activity on the part of the FCC and for the future would create a, uh, a regime in which, in essence, anyone who has a new technology that competes with anything that's already covered by CALEA would have to come in and uh, get approval from the uh, FBI and the FCC showing how exactly they're going to provide all of the features that the FBI has uh, put into its uh, uh, kind of quasi-standards doc uh, documents. Uh, and if they can't do that, then they can't launch their, uh, their new technology. So that is the that's the history, the, uh, uh, very quickly, the technology that we're going to be talking about today and, and uh, that I think is uh, uh, most important uh, is the VOIP technology. I will not try to describe it in detail, but uh, it's a further, it's the result of a further decomposition of uh, MaBell into more and more competing uh, uh, business lines. Uh, um, in the old days, uh, even uh, quite recently, for plain, plain old telephone service, you had a phone, it was connected to a line, the line was connected to a switch, and the switch moved your, your uh, call uh, around the country. Uh, one company, Verizon, say, or Bell South, owned 
uh, uh, that entire system from the phone line through the switch and off into the lines that connected the rest of the uh, metropolitan area. Uh, now with VOIP, we're, we're in a situation where there are potentially three players uh, in that previously seamless, uh, can you hear me uh, all right? Yeah, okay. Uh, in that previously seamless uh, uh, approach, there is first, there is a line that leads from your home or your office uh, uh, to a central office. Uh, at that point, there is likely to be a piece of equipment that is not a switch, uh, but which essentially connects you to an internet service provider. The internet service provider does not have to own the, the line, and in fact, pretty typically does not. Uh, finally, the internet service provider who logs you on and uh, uh, moves your uh, packet communications around the, uh, the internet uh, uh, connects you to application providers who, uh, uh, who may simply be offering you uh, um, a downloaded software or who could be providing services, who could be located in China uh, or next door. Uh, VOIP can be provided by someone who plays only that third role. And this would be a, a product like Skype, for example, in which uh, uh, you download uh, the software and can make the calls and uh, there's very little in the way of infrastructure apart from some initial setup. Uh, or it could be that you connect through your ISP to someone who runs uh, something that looks a lot like a switch, except that it's a, in the form of a computer, uh, this would be Vonage, and would connect your calls uh, uh, and send you a bill every month. Uh, uh, your ISP is likely to be different, but doesn't have to be. In fact, uh, uh, in the cable context, uh, the line, the ISP, and the phone service are typically provided, uh, even though it's VOIP, by the same party, the cable company. Uh, if instead you're using DSL or uh, broadband over a phone line, uh, uh, it's quite likely that you have uh, one company owning the, the line, probably Verizon or SBC or Bell South, uh, another company providing ISP services, uh, AOL or, uh, uh, or Verizon Online or uh, uh, Yahoo. Uh, and then third, uh, you have the company that you're going to buy the VOIP phone service from, which could easily be Vonage. So the breakdown of uh, uh, the industry into those different parts has left uh, uh, significant problems from the Bureau's point of view of who do I go to to get this wiretap, who's going to have the information I need, uh, uh, and will they be able to carry out the wiretaps. Uh, so that is, in essence, the issues that uh, we face. And what I'd like to do is uh, since uh, Jim Dempsey was present while Cleo was being drafted, uh, just ask him to give us a little bit of background about the nature of the compromises that were made to get Kalia uh, uh, passed in '94. Well, Stuart, the, the, the first thing that um, Congress did was to look at uh, what is the problem and spent uh, some considerable uh, time with uh, hearings. Uh, there were two uh, GAO studies. There was a lot of consultation with industry. The FBI and industry actually um, created a uh, working group, which first convened down at Quantico, uh, to discuss and dis the problem, to first agree on what was the problem. And as it emerged, the focus at the time was on the sort of second uh, framework or second environment that you talked about, um, a uh, largely public switch-based uh, network with um, common carriers providing telecommunication service. And the FBI had originally come in and asked to cover all of um, electronic communication service providers. And Congress and ultimately the FBI came to the conclusion that that was not appropriate at the time. Um, now, the issue here is not, of course, can the Internet be tapped? The issue is not about tapping the Internet, should the Internet be tapped or not. That issue was settled in 1986 by Congress with the Electronic Communications Privacy Act in which it took 
the wiretap laws, which in the past had focused only on voice communications and only on wire communications, and had expanded that to include all electronic communications. So the question here is not whether the Internet is somehow uh, off limits to law enforcement or whether there's not adequate legal authority. There clearly is. The question that emerged at the beginning of the 90s was, um, should there be a guaranteed technical capability? And should, in some way, the government mandate the design of the communications networks so as to guarantee that there would be this uh, guaranteed capability and capacity for law enforcement? And Congress said, we have this relatively highly regulated telecom network, these relatively highly regulated entities, common carriers. We understand this. We're going to focus here. These are coming off of a monopolized situation, somewhat of a breakup, somewhat of a proliferation of players, but a relatively defined set of telecommunications common carriers. At the time, Congress was highly aware, of course, that the Internet was out there. But Congress recognized at the time that this is different. It's got a different architecture. It's got a different set of players. It uh, is characterized by innovation, decentralization. Um, and Congress said, we're going to draw a distinction between telecommunications common carriers and information services. Now, in 1994 and then in the 96 Act, the definitional a distinction was between telecommunication services and information services. And information services, in a way, was shorthand for the Internet and applications carried over the Internet, email and instant messaging or uh, web, which was just beginning at the time. And Congress said, we don't really know how design mandates would work for this technology. Most of the wiretaps occur in this public switched telecommunications network. Most people access the Internet through the public switched network. If we want to get email, if we want to get web, we're going to go to that telecommunications common carrier anyhow and get it from them. We'll get all the voice, the data, everything together. That's going to be just fine. We'll sort it out at the FBI. So let's focus these design mandates on that. And that was what was written I think into the legislation, this distinction between telecommunications common carriers and, in essence, everybody else. And that was based upon this fundamental distinction that Congress saw at the time between this relatively highly regulated, centralized uh, telecommunications public switch network and this rapidly evolving, uh, decentralized, user-controlled, innovative, uh, internet and Congress said, we're not going to regulate this. We're not going to uh, stifle this innovation. We're going to focus where the problem is, focus where the concern is, focus on these relatively regulated entities. And if we need to revisit that, it's up to Congress to revisit that. Well, this is the right place to be talking then. Um, I Tony, you, what are your thoughts about this? Uh, should we be covering these, uh, these new technologies? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, I would fundamentally disagree with the, uh, even the history here. Uh, pointing out, first of all, this is a global problem. Governments uh, around the world have faced the same issue and are facing it, and by and large have found solutions. Uh, I actually participate in many of the standards groups, and uh, as I told Stuart, it would be fun. These are all the standards that exist today for the Internet and IP-enabled services for doing what we're talking about. The work's all done. The capabilities have been included in hardware by most of the vendors. And I'll uh, suggest, in addition to the other uh, titles, I'm president of the Lawful uh, Intercept Industry Association, GLIIF.org. And if you go there, you'll find just a copious amount of information about the legal requirements and developments and technologies worldwide. Um, in addition, uh, there are companies like uh, my 
like uh, uh, Warren's and myself and others domestically and internationally that do this as an outsource service. Uh, we do it for customers today. It's not a problem. It's cheap. It's easy. It's effective. And so the only issue really is, um, I think, before the commission in this proceeding, uh, is uh, how whether an effective mandate, which is what the Bureau is requesting, is going to be put into place. And I would point out it's a mandate that pretty much exists everywhere else in the world. We're like the last ones to make it clear that uh, these uh, kinds of technologies <coughs> are covered and uh, carriers have to support them, uh, and, and, and uh, quasi-carriers. And I thought that the Bureau did just an elegant job in their petition in pointing out the fact that the definition of information service provider uh, in CALEA is in fact different than it's characteristically used uh, and that there are, are numerous bases uh, in the act and in the legislative history for in fact the commission uh, imposing these requirements. Uh, actually, I would argue a kind of interesting question would be, notwithstanding CALEA, whether the commission could do this under Title I authority, um, notwithstanding any uh, impediments under CALEA. Uh, so, uh, I guess my comment is, let's do it, and um, we'll work. Well, let, let me ask uh, Mike, who, who administered this program for, for several years, do you think we can uh, get there inside of what CALEA actually says, or is this going to require new legislation? Well, I think the, uh, the Bureau is certainly fishing for new legislation. There's no question what they've asked for in the petition goes well beyond the plain language of the statute. and. However, I think the fundamental issue that the Bureau is trying to put on the table is to, to address what it has believed for a long time, that all communication services should be tappable. And effectively, if it wasn't explicitly excluded by the statute, that way uh, an information services, which has always been very narrowly viewed as just email and the associated attachments to email, whether it be video or, or whatever type of attachment, would be covered by CALEA. And I think this is the fundamental issue before the FCC and the fundamental issue that will sweep under CALEA, the, the umbrella of CALEA, all the technologies that the Bureau is concerned about. Now, absent that, we're, we're in for a long fight over this issue. Now, one, one of the things that I think is, 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 a, is a problem here is um, obviously um, under CALEA, if you, if you have a, a local <coughs> telephone service uh, uh, you're covered by CALEA. You have to design your switches so that you can, uh, so that w law enforcement can conduct the kind of search it wants to. Uh, but if you make computers, or copying machines, or uh, 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 handheld devices, you don't have an obligation to design your products so it's easier for 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 law enforcement. That that's what the whole fight over uh, mandating controls on. Uh, uh, encryption was about. Uh, uh, encryption can defeat any uh, wiretap, uh, and yet uh, uh, the effort by the Bureau to get uh, controls on uh, encryption failed. So at some point, you move from a place that is covered by the requirement to design your product with law enforcement in mind to the rest of the world where technology does what it likes and uh, uh, law enforcement, by and large, benefits from, from the changes in technology. Usually, it, uh, it ends up with more data. Uh, but we've got to draw a line someplace. I, I, where, would, where would you draw that line? Well, I think the problem we we're facing today is the fact that that line is so badly blurred because of the convergence of broadband technologies with traditional telephony that it's going to be very difficult to draw that line. Uh, obviously, the Bureau would like to draw that line uh, very, very close to what an information service is by, b via email because it has the technology, as Tony mentioned, the technology does exist today to capture email. And it, it's either in DCS 1000, the carnivore program developed by the Bureau to address that problem. Today, there are, there are sniffers on the market that carriers can buy, <coughs> service providers can buy that will allow them to isolate an individual's communications and deliver that to law enforcement. So the technology is out there, as Tony mentioned, and, and I think that uh, apart from sweeping everything under the Akulia umbrella, that's really what the Bureau is after. And uh, once it gets that, then it can bring to bear on the industry 
the enforcement provisions of CALEA, the mandates of standards associated with CALEA, and that's really what it's trying to do, trying to clarify the fact that everyone who provides communications from one party to another is, in fact, subject to electronic surveillance, which is clearly established under the electronic surveillance statutes, but also that they are involved with CALEA by way of modifying the network to ensure that they can be tapped. Well, I, I want to come back to what the consequences are for, for technology uh, policy to, uh, of applying those regulatory impacts. But I, it seems to me that whether you're an FCC staffer dealing with the petition or a congressional staffer who's got a legislative proposal in the making coming from the FBI, there's got to be a point where you say, okay, this is covered, this is not, this is going to be guaranteed convenient for law enforcement, and here law enforcement just has to take its lumps, you know, take it as it comes. Um, and uh, uh, maybe Praveen, uh, since you're the most technologically literate of the folks uh, up here, uh, or at least you're, you're closest to the technology, uh, maybe you could uh, offer your thoughts on where you'd draw that line. Sure, absolutely. Um, and let me start by giving maybe just like a, a two-second overview of, of, of what COVAD does. We are a broadband provider. Um, we, we provide DSL and T1 services. We are an information service provider. We provide internet access services. And we're soon to be a VoIP provider when we close uh, on a recent acquisition of a VoIP company. So, so we do all three of the things. I think that, that the DOJ and FBI is concerned about all these issues hit very close to home for us. Um, with, with respect to the question of, of where that line should be drawn between the, the things that are covered by CALEA that have this architectural requirement um, and the things that are not covered by CLIA, where there's more room to innovate and, 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 and DOJ just has to kind of take its licks. We think that Congress already drew that line in the CLIA statute as it's written. Um, if, you, if, you, if you think about what's happened in the marketplace and, and the marketplace changes that I think law enforcement's concerned about, we're, we're coming out of a world where the primary means of accessing the Internet is dial-up services, and what's changed is that transmission layer. Instead of using dial-up, people are now using broadband services like COVAD services, DSL services, T1 services to get to that Internet access um, IP layer. Um, th those underlying uh, transmission facilities, those underlying transmission services are still covered by CALEA. That architectural requirement still applies to them. So with respect to, to our uh, transmission layer services, our layer 2 services, we're still under a CALEA architectural requirement. We, we, we still provide law enforcement access. Um, it, I, I just went over um, some of our internal statistics yesterday to, uh, to see how we're doing in terms of our, our, our law enforcement uh, subpoena compliance. We, we got about 80 subpoenas last year. We complied with every one of them to the extent we, we had the information. Out of those 80, we got one wiretap request. So, so we're, we're, we're making the information available to law enforcement where we have it. If we don't have it, we work with law enforcement to help them get the information from other service providers um, th that do have that information. So, so we think that that line is already established. It's already there. It already works. Um, and and it, it's a good line. It's a sensible line because the line that Congress drew was in making sure that the transmission layer is architected such that law enforcement can get access to it as they do today, and above that, in the IP space, in the internet access space, in the VoIP space, and in the multitude of applications that broadband is going to make possible, there's room for innovation. There is not that architectural requirement, but by making that underlying transmission layer, the telecom service layer, accessible, law enforcement can get what it needs. And, and, and we think it's actually working uh, fairly well. There's, there's still some work to be done on the standard setting side. Um, and I think that that work is, is taking place. TIA just recently, and I see Grant Seifert here, TIA recently uh, released standards for packet mode compliant services like, and, and Grant can probably uh, 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 chime in and, and give some more detail on this, but um, they, they recently released standards um, for things like uh, packet mode voice, for things like um, uh, uh, packet mode pagers. So the, 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 the standards are working. We, we think that the line that's there is working. And instead of uh, rewriting the statute or by virtual rulemaking, we think effectively re rewriting the statute, um, what's needed instead is, is let the system work as it's currently working. So if I could oversimplify it, you're saying that uh, CALEA ought to pl apply to the line that goes from your house to the central office. Uh, which has the advantage of not being able to leave the country, uh, uh, and you can you can regulate that. But that beyond that, it ought to be technology ought to be free to uh, innovate and shouldn't be subject to regulation. That, that's exactly our view. Okay. Uh, 
Jim? Stuart, yeah, if I could just uh, reemphasize a point that you alluded to, which I think is a crucial point in terms of thinking about drawing the line. We all talk about drafting legislation that is technology neutral. And uh, to some extent, CALEA is technology neutral, although it turns out it's actually harder to be technology neutral than you think if you really try to do it. Um, CALEA does to some extent talk about calls and call identifying information. Now, CALEA in other respects is clearly a technology neutral statute. But the FBI in its petition is not really so technology neutral. They're clearly focusing on voice or broadband telephony. They, they actually agree with Praveen about the uh, transport layer, and they talk about access to the transport layer. But when they talk about services and applications, they're not technology neutral. They're talking about a voice. But I think it's very hard, if not impossible, once you cross into the packet uh, environment um, and once you're leaving the telecommunications common carrier, it's at that point very hard to stop as to where you draw the line among packets because if you've got uh, a voice, if you've got an email, if you've got web, if you've got a picture, um, it's very hard the way the system is architected for a service provider, certainly for a service provider at the transport layer, it, 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 the system is designed for those people not to pay attention to what is in um, those packets. Uh, Stuart, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, this is just not the case. I'm an en engineer as well as a lawyer, and I actually... Uh-oh, pulling rank. <laughs> yes. Uh, I actually participate in these standards organizations and work with the companies that implement these capabilities. In fact, uh, two weeks ago when there was a conference in town, uh, one of the vendors stood up and said, no, we can do this right now, just shouted it from the back, uh, left no doubt whatsoever. And that is the case. It's, uh, and you were very persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, relatively uh, trivial. And the reason it's trivial is not to look at this as a U.S. problem. This is a problem worldwide. And two of these standards, for example, are Cisco's, and you ask, why, are, why, is, why has Cisco gone ahead and developed their own standards for doing this? In fact, their own software for all their products for doing this. It's because it's a global problem, and these requirements exist worldwide. And indeed, the challenge for the industry that's doing this goes way beyond whether the requirements should exist or not. It's basically how you can make the uh, standards uh, globally interoperable so law enforcement can share this information, particularly with things like the Cybercrime Treaty coming into force. Uh, it's these kinds of issues that are actually the challenge, not the uh, what is really last decade problem of establishing a mandate to do it. Uh, the United States should have long done it like every other country. One of the interesting. But, uh, actually, let, 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 Mike, let, me, let me comment about that one for one quick moment. The the FBI, in fact, did lead the charge w worldwide on developing legislation, much like CALEA, but in, offering suggestions and support to other countries in what we did wrong, and that was not mandating that wiretap capability be imp implemented within the. Uh, licensing provisions of the, that particular country so carriers would have to have wiretap capability when they brought service to market. And many of the countries have done that. They've actually legislated the fact that they can't do business in this country unless you can be wiretapped. So that was probably the one thing that the international forum, if you will, of, of law enforcement agencies and departments of justice and the like uh, did in fact share and, and everybody was looking at CULIA as the model. And we were over there banging the bell, don't look at it as the only model. You, you, you must look at the issues that have, have prohibited implementation in the U.S. and, and correct those. And I, for the most part, what Tony said is true, that, uh, that the other countries have done that. Now, I, I, the, the Voice of America is prohibited from releasing news stories that, that, 
uh, it's the internationally that will blow back on the United States uh, into the United States and be consumed by the American public. But I take it the FBI doesn't have that, that restriction. They can propose legislation that, and standards that they know will blow back into the United States course, without no, any problem. We, we never lobby. <laughs> we only, the, the FBI only briefs and provides a counsel. <laughs> Stuart, I would just uh, say that I sort of got a little burned on um, looking at what other countries are doing and using that as the model. Um, during the Kalia process of um, debating it, I sat in a room with uh, Louis Free, the FBI director, and Jim Kalstrom, uh, who was uh, the sort of leader on this, with several members of Congress. And the director of the FBI said, we just want what Canada has already done, where, North, where the Royal Canadian Mounted Police had gone to Nortel, which um, is a Canadian switch manufacturer has a large percentage of the Canadian market. The FBI said, the director said, we just want what the Canadians have already done, where they've already built this. And uh, members of Congress said, oh, gosh, that sounds good. They've already done it there. Let's do it. After the legislation was passed, the FBI came in and said, no, turns out what Nortel did isn't good enough for us. The Nortel solution is noncompliant with Kalia. We want more than that. Yeah, there, I, the, the FBI is obviously not used to playing a regulatory role. And not used to necessarily accepting that what is being done in other countries is good enough for the United States. Let me, let me ask Praveen, uh, uh, suppose we uh, uh, expanded it uh, back out to the application layer uh, uh, so that uh, we're talking about people who offer services who don't have any physical connection to the consumer. Uh, people like Vonage uh, or people like Skype and said, uh, uh, no, we, uh, we intend to regulate those folks. They can't offer their services in the United States. They can't develop products in the United States without first showing how they're going to conduct wiretaps in accordance with the, uh, the plain old telephone system uh, wiretaps. Uh, uh, what's, what's the impact on, uh, on industry of, of expanding the obligation that far? Well, I, I think the, the impact would be huge. Um, I think the impact would be that now anytime any new broadband enabled, IP enabled service application comes out, it's got to, uh, under the FBI's petition, first go through a pre-clearance process at the FCC uh, under the, under the essentially the veto power of, of law enforcement before it gets rolled out. It, it, it's funny, um, uh, when we were preparing our, our, our comments in the FCC's proceeding uh, spurred by the DOJ's petition, I, I, I kind of asked myself the question, well, what, what would have happened if the, the rules the FBI is asking for had been in place, whether legislatively or, or through rulemaking, um, at the time that broadband was being rolled out? Well, actually, there, there wouldn't be any broadband rolled out in America today because at the time that broadband services were first being rolled out, Nobody knew exactly what they had to do in order to make the assistance capability requirements available. It's a, it's a process of industry figuring that out, working together, and coming up with, with solutions. And I think that in the Internet access space, um, we've seen that work well. ISPs regularly comply with law enforcement re requests, uh, whether it's for, for subscriber information or whether it's for actual content for wiretaps. But if they had had to go through a pre-clearance process, um, at the FCC, supervised by, by, the, by, by the DOJ prior to rolling those things out, I'm not sure we would have Internet access uh, rolled out to the extent we have it today. So I think that the impact um, of creating that requirement would be huge. And I, I'm, I'm still not sure that it's necessary. I think that, um, I think that the case still has to be made that, that uh, law enforcement is, is simply unable to get access to these types of information today. Well, Tony, we're putting you in the spot of sort of speaking for the Bureau. What do you think about that uh, argument? Um, first of all, by the way, it's kind of fun to talk about this as the FBI and the Bureau, but the reality is there's about 10,000 law enforcement agencies throughout the United States, and if you look at the statistics, actually, most of the lawful intercepts are uh, state and local. And so, and uh, the, the Bureau is just one of many federal agencies. So what we're really talking about is facilitating the ability for all of law enforcement in this country uh, to uh, have these capabilities. Yeah, they, they, the Bureau has, will, will tell you that they effectively speak for local law enforcement when they do this. But do you, do you want to answer the question about yeah. what, what's going to be the okay, impact now, on now, it? Now there's, now, what, you, you, what, what, are you going to answer that question? I, yes, I will. <laughs> okay. And I'll answer it by actually reading what right. the Bureau asked for. 
because this is like urban legend that the Bureau is asking for this pre-clearance process. What's actually in the petition should require any carrier that believes that any current plan facilities or services are not subject to CALEA to file a petition. To me, frankly, they can do that now. Um, so there's no onerous pre-clearance process for rolling out new services that's suggested. If you actually read what they asked for, it's, it, it, it's common sense. Wait, wait, wait. It's it says if, if any, anybody who has technology who thinks he's not covered by the law should file something. No, it? it says if they believe that they're not subject to CALEA, they can file a petition. Well, they can do that now. Can so, or must? If, well, if, they, if, if there's a possible argument that they are covered, if they compete in any way with an existing covered service, the FBI has said they should be subject to it as well. And so if you have any doubt at all, you have to file, uh, and, and, and the suggestion is uh, only file if you want to get out, because otherwise we're going to assume you're covered. Isn't that, isn't that well, what it says? Well, that's pretty much what exists today. How is that any different? What they're, how is what they're asking for any different than what they're Okay, they're well, I, I, you, I have let you, but I'm not going to uh, <laughs> sn slip away from the question. Uh, the, the question was, uh, uh, is there going to be a significant impact on people's ability to carry out uh, uh, new technology, even if this is what you're, you're saying? You say, uh, you have to file if you think you're not covered. Anybody who's innovating in this space, and this space is sort of not very well defined, um, has to go to the FCC and say, I'm not covered, right? Is that, is that, you think that's not going to have an impact on, on innovation? No. It's not? No impact. No impact because it's no more than already, what already exists, both domestically and globally. And for the most part, vendors of these capabilities, um, like Cisco and many others that are unmentioned, uh, in facing these requirements, actually build the capacity in. Well, uh, and uh, how many uh, agencies has Skype filed with for a determination that they're not covered by this? Well, Skype actually uh, is, uh, is sort of a, uh, working this right now with PIDS, which is the equivalent of the FBI in, uh, in the Netherlands. But they're also offering, you can, you, can, you can download Skype today. Uh, you wouldn't be able to if this rule were in effect. Oh, uh, not necessarily. Skype actually is, a, I think, Skype is basically a peer-to-peer -peer VOIP capability. It, there's lots of those kinds of things. You can do them between Xboxes, right? Um, it's not clear that that, the, that that would be covered at all. So where do you draw the line? I'm, I'm, I'm confused then. Uh, uh, some applications aren't covered by this rule? Uh, absolutely. Okay. In so fact, that's that's the whole thrust of actually the omnibus FCC proceeding of which this is a part, which we sort of neglected to say in our history. The uh, uh, the uh, FCC has a, a kind of a, an omnibus proceeding on uh, developing a regulatory framework that sets forth all kinds of mandates for IP enabled and VOIP services. This is just one of those mandates. And, uh, and, and but 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 what we're 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 we're, we're we have been trying to figure out so if somebody's going to draft legislation or or write an FCC rule, you got to figure out what's covered and what's not. The F the FBI's rule is if you compete with a covered service. Well, I'm sure Skype competes with VOIP, and VOIP is supposed to be covered. Uh, so I would have thought that they were covered. Where, where do you draw the line? Where, where, where would you advise the commission or or Congress to draw the line? It's not apparent that in this petition the bureau. And, or any other agencies are asking for peer-to-peer -peer VOIP uh, coverage. Uh, but but, but, they, but it, it, it does compete with VOIP. That's what the language is, right? Well, but that's the issue before the commission, and we'll okay. see when the NPR you, comes you, you out. Would, you, would not, you would not draw the line there? No, I mean, fundamentally, there's a problem when you're dealing with peer-to-peer -peer anything, right? Uh, the only way you're going to get access to it is at the local access provider, and that's what the broadband internet access piece goes to. Right. You just you just extract it out of that stream. Well, Jim? Yeah, I think that uh, we certainly don't want to encourage terrorists to go to peer-to-peer -peer, um, as a way of avoiding surveillance. And I don't think, I mean, again, I think the, the line drawing question here um, is the difficult one to which nobody has the answer. I think it's Congress's job to draw those kinds of lines. But Stuart, I'd like to shift to a different uh, mm -hmm. take on this for a second and uh, 
engage uh, Tony and uh, Mike Warren from a different perspective, and that is, I think that in, in, the, in the telecommunications, going back to where Congress was in 94, in the telecommunications network, <laughs> there was a problem with the fact that the content stream of communications was being handled by carriers differently than the call setup and transactional information was. And that was one of the major problems that they brought to the attention of Congress in 94. Basically, in the switch network, those elements were carried on different channels. And there was no doubt and no, as you had said, no controversy about capturing the content. We've had a 10-year struggle. If you read the second half of the FBI's petition, they tell you how terrible Kalia has been applied to the normal telecom network. The whole debate was over what is call identifying information, who captures it, who separates it, how you format it, whether you reach into the content stream and pull certain information out of the content stream and deliver it to law enforcement on the uh, signaling stream, etc. And remember, we had the switching facilities were in the control of a relatively few common carriers. Now we have something new, two things new actually, that weren't present in 94. One is, in the packet environment, the content and the signaling information are carried together. They're right in the same packet. In fact, sometimes the content is signaling information that is read as signaling or processing information by different applications. So this question that the content was over here and the signaling was over here and it was hard to get them both and associate them with each other, that problem's gone in the packet world. You don't need Kalia to require anybody to capture them and associate them with each other. They come with the data stream. And if, as uh, Praveen says, if you're willing, if, if the people who provide the access, that transport layer, are willing to capture and able to capture all of those packets and deliver them to law enforcement, then I think the problem is solved. Now, You've got a second, without legislation, without regulation, without design mandates, and out, without the kind of struggle that has characterized Kalia 1. Now, secondly, you've got something brand new, which is you have service, provi uh, service bureaus. VeriSign and FiduciaNet have taken on this intermediary role that did not really exist in 1994. In 1994, law enforcement went to the telephone company, and it was just between the telephone company and law enforcement, by and large, to work out how wiretapping was done. Now, entrepreneurs like Verisign and like Mike Warren have gone out and said, we'll take on this responsibility. We'll follow all these standards processes. We'll develop the equipment. We'll study new technologies coming out whether it's Skype or whether it's uh, Vonage or anything else. We'll figure this out and we'll break apart these packets, analyze them, and give it to law enforcement on a silver platter in the format that law enforcement wants. And no entrepreneur, no innovator online has to seek governmental approval. We'll work it out. And I think that the sort of model Again, Congress had a model in mind when it adopted CALEA. It had in mind the ARBOC model, the regional bell operating company post AT&T, but still mon relatively monopolized, relatively centralized model. Now we have a totally different model where you have a lot more players and you have people like VeriSign and FiduciaNet prepared to work with them. I think the kind of regulatory model of CALEA it's just not necessary or applicable or relevant to this new uh, internet space with all of these new technologies coming available. I think we have a solution at hand. I don't want to head down the road of an FCC rulemaking and court challenges and FBI trying to dictate to verisign what they do. Work it out by contract. Just set it up by contract. Every service provider who has a pipe will give the pipe and if there's any entity that should be regulated, it should be the VeriSigns and fiducia nets of the world who are under an obligation to carry out in good faith their activity and make sure they only deliver to law enforcement what law enforcement is entitled to intercept. 
and you could actually build in some auditing and oversight of that to make sure that on a pen register or trap and trace, for example, that law enforcement is only getting a signaling information and not getting content. But I think that uh, rather than having uh, an FCC uh, rulemaking, rather than trying even to worry about redrawing these lines, we know who a common carrier is. They still have the obligation. The rest of them give that packet stream, and you use a service bureau like a VeriSign or FiduciNet to sort it out and to work with law enforcement to deliver it in a formatted way. So, Mike and Tony, is, is, is this just about who writes the check to you? Is this about whether the government is going to do it or whether uh, industry is going to be required to pay you? Uh, it's in part, but I think um, I'm almost tempted to say we ought to hire Jim on. Yeah. <laughs> Great marketing guy. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> it, it is. But I, I combine that with that I don't want to get the FBI into the design phase here. I don't want to get the FCC into the design phase. Uh, you, you actually don't. And I think uh, the reason why is, um, again, uh, these, these tend to be actually global requirements. And uh, behind the scenes, they're all being dealt with. But um, I actually brought some extra copies of our uh, filings with the FCC uh, in our reply comments, as you probably have seen. Uh, I actually suggested that the, the FCC might want to, when they came out with the NPRM, because architecture for an in, in, in Internet kind of environment, in, environment makes such a profound difference in terms of the burdens and the costs that the, uh, that the Commission actually w might want to do something like that, to actually consider the uh, Service Bureau architecture as part of a fundamental part of the, uh, of the obligations and the solution, and interestingly enough, uh, Commissioner Edelstein, in his remarks at the um, trade show here uh, 10 days ago, uh, thought it was a particularly innovative approach and welcomed it. So it'll be okay. quite interesting. Mike, Mike, is it is it okay with you if the FCC writes your business model into the Federal Register? Well, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, I think the uh, in our meetings with the FCC recently, in fact, they almost alluded to that. Uh, the fact that if a carrier chooses to file 109B as asking for an exemption based upon reasonable achievability, they're going to have to look at potentially other alternative services for solutions other than just their manufacturer or doing it in-house. So th I think there will be a mention of the service bureaus in the FCC's NPRM, and, and we'll see some I interesting comments about that. But going back to the first question that Jim raised, and, and I think we have to look back at the statute on the issue of whether or not law enforcement can dictate what the, what the service provider is building. And it's clearly explicit in the statute that they cannot. And the, the law enforcement cannot ha does not have that authority, and I think the FCC will dismiss that clearly in, in the petition. There are several issues within the petition that, that are outside the scope of CULIA, and uh, I think that's one of them. I'm going to uh, uh, open it up for questions after we've gone through one more round of discussion, uh, uh, because I think you know, uh, to, it's after lunch now. Uh, to get everybody interested again, I want to bring in USA Patriot, uh, um, which is, I think, relevant to the question of why the FBI has been so determined to get call identifying information uh, in the context of Internet service and VOIP. And um, I'll ask Jim and perhaps Praveen to talk about uh, what the connection between what happened in USA Patriot and uh, the Bureau's position here is. Well, it's, a, it's an indirect uh, connection only. Um, the Patriot Act has a, a specific provision in it in Title II explicitly saying that nothing in CALEA, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, nothing in the Patriot Act imposes any design mandate or any uh, tech requirement or any uh, obligation on service providers. Uh, there was a provision in the Patriot Act that made it clear what had been clear to me before and had been clear to the courts before, which is that the pen register trap and trace laws did apply to the Internet and apply to electronic communications and that there was some <coughs> rough equivalency somewhere between the kind of dialing information that's associated with um, telephone calls and the signaling or routing information that's associated with uh, uh, um, Internet communications. Uh, in a way, the Patriot Act made the uh, pen register trap and trace law technology neutral even more clearly than had been done 
uh, when the law was first adopted. But again, that leaves aside the question of is there a design mandate and um, um, who bears the responsibility of doing the analysis that allows you to conclude that a particular packet is a, a voice packet or an email packet or part of a photograph or something else. The, the key factor, of course, is, is that there are roughly ten times more pen registers and trap and trace devices than there are content interceptions. The standard is much lower. In fact, it's almost a rubber stamp. It is a rubber stamp standard for getting the pen register and trap and trace authority. And law enforcement does ten times as many of those than they do content interceptions, which are relatively uh, labor intensive and require a higher uh, Fourth Amendment type, constitutional type uh, approval. But I, I guess uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, while it's true that you're, it was clarifying the law and making it technology neutral, the fact is an old pen register on a phone call told law enforcement who I called and how long I talked, what number I called or what number called me. Uh, when you translate that into the Internet world, it tells them every web page I went, uh, went to, what page I went to within the website, uh, and uh, how long I spent reading what was there or um, uh, what emails I sent, who I sent them to, uh, I, how long they were, whether there were attachments and the like. I, it's, it's probably a substantially more intimate look into the activities of the person who's subject to the uh, order than a simple pen trap. Uh, and so there, that would up the ante, it seems to me, and, and be one reason why uh, the FBI, which can get a pen trap order basically uh, easier than I could fall off the chair here that I'm sitting on, um, it would make them more yeah, enthusiastic about that's it. That's definitely like that. true. And um, clearly, uh, the legal standard is why CDT has argued uh, that the legal standard for the pen register and trap and trace is uh, too low um, because there's a much richer uh, source of transactional information. I mean, one of the things that none of us should forget now is that this is the golden age of surveillance. Um, the notion that somehow law enforcement is disadvantaged because of uh, digital technology or the Internet, there is so much information out there, and they get so much information, and they are able to manipulate it in ways that are so much easier than ever before. And what you're talking about is to even some extent true on the traditional telephone side, but is truer in spades on the uh, Internet side, that this this, this technique has become much, much more fruitful. Praveen, do you want to give us uh, uh, your thoughts on this, and then we'll open it up to questions? Sure. I, I, I don't think I have much to add to, to what Jim just said. I mean, our, our view on, 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 on where the bar is set for, uh, for pen register trap and trace is that that's really a matter for the, for the Congress to decide, and, and we see our role as uh, when, when law enforcement knocks on our door with a, a lawful court order, we comply with it. The, 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 the one point I do want to make, though, is that um, e even, even though uh, I think a lot, I think you're right that a lot of the focus uh, in the FBI petition is is uh, probably on uh, enhancing law enforcement's ability to get um, trap and trace uh, uh, pen register type information. We have the capability to provide that today, and, and in fact, we, we do provide it. Now, um, perhaps there's more work to be done, again, in the industry standard setting for uh, to, to come up with better processes for doing that. But the fact is we provide it today. We have processes to do it. We allow law enforcement to access our network to capture that information. So it, it's not as though the information is totally being lost. Is the problem. I have a, could I ask one yep. question? Yep. Of Jim. Uh, Jim, you talked about the pen register trap and trace statutes and their ease of uh, access to the network basically by showing relevance to the investigation. What are, are you suggesting then that uh, law enforcement must use the ECPA 2703 uh, specific and articulable facts? Uh, yeah, we had argued, we have, we have argued that it should be, right now under the pen register trap and trace statute, any government official only needs to come in and certify that the information sought is relevant to an ongoing investigation. Um, he doesn't have to show that it's relevant. He doesn't have to explain why it's relevant. The only question for the judge is, has a law enforcement officer certified that it is relevant? And at that point there, the statute says the court shall uh, issue the order. Um, 
We've argued that there should be some minimal factual inquiry. Well, you, you know, tell me what this is about and why are you interested in this particular communication stream? Show me some basic facts that would show uh, that there's a reason to believe that a crime is being or is about to be committed or is being planned and that the information is relevant. So you want to see the court having some judicial review yes. and the ability to deny as opposed to yes. rubber stamp. Yes. Yes. Okay, questions, uh, uh, Rob? I, I, Tim uh, asked me to summarize the uh, questions before I uh, uh, so for the uh, TV camera, but I, I can't do justice to that uh, eloquent <laughs> statement. But uh, the, the, I think the short version of it is, uh, uh, isn't it impossible to regulate applications because uh, if you regulate Vonage, then you just end up with Chinage. Uh, and uh, uh, and once once you have unregulated applications offering this, uh, all the crooks and terrorists will uh, uh, use those systems, and so your heavy regulation of the U.S. industry doesn't buy you any access to sophisticated cr criminals' uh, 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 remarks. Uh, uh, I'll ask uh, Jim and Tony to address that. Well, I mean, the question implies the answer, and I agree with the premise of the question. Um, you know, one of the things that Kalia was not intended to um, guarantee was uh, it was not intended to guarantee that the FBI did not have to uh, keep up with technological changes. They clearly do, um, and they should. And uh, in that sense, they serve a very important role of uh, also working with state and local police and uh, helping them uh, through their engineering uh, research facility to keep up with technology. I think if you look at the FBI and the kind of service bureau function that is being offered now in the marketplace, something that didn't exist in 94, that you see a much better path to a solution. Last year, what were the f statistics last year about the number? There were 1,442 wiretaps, 12 of which were Internet-based. Mm -hmm. like 12 of which were Internet-based. Why would we ever go out in the case of 12 taps and regulate with ubiquity a whole complex set of applications, service providers, designers, people literally in their garages, developing new things, when instead we have 12 intercepts that involve Internet communications, all of which, by the way, were successfully completed, as far as we can tell, um, when with all this multiplicity of applications, bring it in and either with the Service Bureau or with the FBI, sort that out break it apart, analyze it, figure out what it is. They'll clearly have to do so anyhow because with peer-to-peer, -peer, as Tony Rukowski has explained, anybody can go out there and build anything they want. Now, it, they got to get there still over some facilities service provider. And right now, the big ones are for broadband, DSL and cable, both of whom had sa have said we're 100 percent capable and willing uh, and believe we are legally bound or should be legally bound to provide that data stream associated with a particular customer. Satellite is obviously sort of a third 
uh, possibi uh, possibility that some people use, um, but it clearly falls in the same category, that there's somebody there who can capture that, that stream. I just don't see the need. The, the FBI has an understandable desire here for certainty, for knowing in advance what it is, for dealing with this complexity. But Congress in 94 and in 96 in the Telecom Reform Act clearly said, we want complexity, we want diversity. And this has been the driver of this whole development of a whole proliferation of services and a whole new possibilities of communication. The policy of 94 and 96 succeeded. It's been hell for uh, telecom, traditional telecom carriers who are all scrambling to keep up and are working hard to do that. But the, the vision worked, and I don't see any need to go back against it. Tony? The um, answer is actually not at the applications level, but in between, at the port level. And that's where most of the specifications are written. If you, you know, care to want to go through this stuff, it's, it's been all done over the last several years, and it's been all implemented. And you basically extract stuff out based on what TCP or UDP ports are being used. Uh, but the real problem is, are these dudes. Um, it's the, f and this is the challenge. I really take exception that somehow, you know, law enforcement's life is easier today. They, when you can basically pop this in, go out here in the Supreme Court steps, get access to almost anything you want, including VOIP, or do it at Starbucks, or do it at any one of thousands of places in the United States or around the world. It, it, the, the real fundamental problem is nomadicity and the fact that, and, and, and another thing that's plainly wrong, VOIP actually does have a separate signaling channel uh, for the most part. Uh, there's peer-to-peer, -peer, but usually it's either SIP or enum facilitated. And uh, so law enforcement still has to get access to that stuff and still has to piece it together and still has to figure out what's going on. And it's a global problem because it can be facilitated offshore as well. So it, it, by no means is their life easier, but, uh, and they're just trying to look forward a little bit and keep ahead of the curve so that the whole panoply of capabilities for forensic investigation that they have had uh, will be available two or three years from now. I think we've probably got time for one more question before nobandicity sets in here. Uh, <laughs> yes, Gertrude. Yeah, I have actually two questions. Maybe different people want to respond to them. The first actually follows up on the last comment. You were referring to a Wi-Fi card there. And so um, could, could some of the other panelists maybe address this concern? How, how can tapping be done at the application slave, at the, at the transport level? If, um, if we have Wi-Fi and, and it's, I guess, not clear who's accessing the, uh, the connection, the cordless connection. And secondly, no one's addressed the Grant X decision and uh, its distinction between information and telecommunication services. And I I'm just wondering whether anyone has any thoughts on how that issue plays in with Korea. Well, we're going to make Praveen answer that because he, he used to work at the uh, FCC. Uh, the question uh, uh, for Praveen is uh, how does Brand X uh, play into this debate? Well, I, I think Brand X plays in uh, kind of uh, on, the, on the side a little bit. Uh, what was at issue in Brand X was the classification of cable modem services and, and whether those contain a telecommunications service component. And in the Brand X litigation, the Ninth Circuit, uh, 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 relying on a previous decision it had made in the at v Portland decision, I believe in 99, um, decided that w uh, w once again, cable modem service does include a telecom service component as well as an information service component. Um, that's all on the cable modem side. On the, on the DSL side, which is, which is what COVAD does, we're not in the cable modem business. On the DSL side, the, the FCC has historically held that there is a, a telecom service component um, as, as well as an internet access component in DSL. They have that question teed open right now in the wireline broadband NPRM. And so I think the, the Brand X litigation um, re relates to that and raises a lot of similar issues. Um, and certainly the holding in Brand X would support the notion that there is a, a, a telecom service component um, in, 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 a, in broadband access media. But I think the, the Brand X is limited to the, the cable modem side. Okay, and the other question was, uh, uh, what about wireless? Uh, and uh, 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 Jim, you're welcome to take it, or I'll take it. Go ahead. Uh, 
go, go ahead. I have a thought. But a okay. Well, I, I got a couple of thoughts on wireless. First, it's brand new, and uh, it's easy to get scared by something that's brand new. Uh, uh, but in fact, uh, it's basically the same problem that uh, pay phones create. Uh, people can walk up to them and, and use them, and you can't uh, wiretap them immediately. Uh, uh, law enforcement has learned to live with that, and I don't remember a petition to ban pay phones when they first came out. Uh, uh, second, uh, new technology creates new opportunities. I think that if you uh, uh, were a law enforcement agent uh, and you had a moderately but not fully competent crook using Starbucks to send uh, communications from his laptop, you could probably open up your laptop next to him and rip off every file that he has <laughs> available for sharing. Um, those of you from the Judiciary Committee are laughing. Um, it, the, um, it, it, there are lots of opportunities that are created by these technologies, and assuming that you have to regulate access is probably not the right assumption. I also think, I, I, I think the payphone example is exactly the correct um, reference point. And I don't think there is anything in the FBI petition that would deal with the nomadicity problem. The, the nomadicity problem is a problem of knowing which service provider to go to. Once you know which is the service provider, which you know which payphone the person is going to pick up or which bank of payphones they're going to go to, you're home free. Law enforcement has always been home free. The hard part that's not addressed by the petition at all and not addressed by CALEA is the question of trying to figure out which is the right service provider. But I think the opportunities point is another good point. There is going to be data out there to f be found. And, but Tony, last point? Uh, I believe it is addressed by the Patriot Act, though. And uh, the good news is there are solutions. Which section? Uh, the uh, the Patri Patriot Act, in part, deals with the problem, uh, with certainly the, the, the roving wiretap piece, um, deals with that. Uh, and, um, no, 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 and I'm sorry, Tony. I, I, I just don't think it does. The, the roving tap authority of Calia simply gave roving tap authority under FISA, which had existed on the criminal side. The problem still remains, which service provider do you go to? All right, well, all right, more than we already wanted to know, probably, <laughs> about roving wiretaps. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we uh, invite people who want to ask questions uh, to come up afterwards and that you join me in thanking a really fine panel.